Welcome back to Hoochos. Today on Hoochos, I'm going to take you on a tour around all of the hydroponic systems. So all of the hydroponic systems in the greenhouse, the ground-based NFT, the Dutch buckets, the DIY 3D printable Dutch bucket adapters, the screw-on snorkels that allow us to make cheap Dutch buckets, the NFT, the flood and drain, the super simple strawberry systems. Outside, we're gonna have a look at the rain gutter grow systems, the dragon fruit hydroponic system, as well as the float box, a ginger and turmeric system, which I haven't released a video yet on, the self-watering pots, both the larger version and the smaller modular source of version that I've designed as well. So there's a lot to cover in today's episode and I'll put timestamps in the description so that you can skip ahead to whichever system you wanna catch up on. All right, let's start in the greenhouse. Okay, so this is the DIY NFT. As you can see, it's supplying nutrients and water perfectly. These red pak choy are actually elongating a little bit, and I'd say that's because of the heat, the environment that they're in. However, the nutrient solution is staying really nice and cool. And what I actually wanna do is I wanna show you how cool it is by testing the temperature on that nutrient solution and in the roots. So I wanna show you the root temperature of these plants for a reason, there is a reason. Um, so if I just quickly measure temperature of the water, so 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about five degrees under ambient temperature because the ambient temperature here is about 30 at the moment. The root temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and that's 77 degrees Fahrenheit as well. So the nutrient solution is staying cool within my NFT, cooler than the ambient temperature, and that is because of the size of the reservoir. So over here we have the reservoir. Uh, it's a 700 litre, it's an IBC, so it was originally a 1000 litre, but I've cut it down to flip it. It's a 700 litre res, but the water level at the moment, it's only at about 300 litres probably. I'll give you a look in there. It's a bit of a mess and you can see, actually you can see the, the rainbow chard or the silver beet roots, the red on those roots. And that is from, that is from the silver beet, the red coloring on the silver beet. It extends down to the roots, which is really interesting. But you can see even with the 300 liters that's in that reservoir, temperature of the water is 26.8 degrees Celsius which is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So the large reservoir is actually acting like a heat buffer for the nutrient solution. So that it keeps the channels and the roots cooler in the heat of the day. 25 degrees is about the perfect temperature for a nutrient solution. As it's running down the channel, the evaporative cooling on the nutrient film is cooling it down that extra couple of degrees, which is creating the perfect root environment for these plants. Also, the reservoir is covered by green matter, which is causing a microclimate around the top of the reservoir. So no light is both penetrating or heating up the nutrient solution in my reservoir. And this is contrasted by this ground-based NFT. Now, if I measure the root temperature and water temperature of this NFT, we will have 31.8 degrees Celsius and 89.2 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is the channel temperature and the root temperature is 89 degrees Fahrenheit and 32 degrees Celsius. Now that is not an ideal temperature. That's actually higher than the ambient temperature of the environment. I'm not really happy with this system and it's not because it's on the ground, it's because of the reservoir. Now the reservoir for this system is a 20 litre bucket, but it's only full about 10 litres. And I'd say there's probably another five litres traveling through the NFT at any one time. And the temperature of this water is 32.7 degrees Celsius, uh, which is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So what isn't happening here is any buffering of temperature at all. Because it's such a small water mass, any heat that comes through this system ends up in here. And because it's such a small amount of water, it doesn't have the same buffering capacity as the larger, even the two to 300 liters that's in the other reservoir. So as much as I like this as an idea, it's 
probably not the best design if you're dealing with warmer environments because the ground here is actually <laughs> the ground it's out of the sun and the ground is 36 degrees celsius uh, which is 97 degrees fahrenheit so because this is buried it's not only dealing with the heat coming back in from our channels it's dealing with the heat from the ground that it's buried in as well, which is actually hotter than the ambient temperature. So my other NFT being out of the ground right now is actually better for it because the temperature in the air is 30 degrees compared to 36 degrees on, in the ground. Another thing is you can see at the front here where I've doubled the amount of four millimeter tubing that feeds each one of these channels. I had a couple of instances where these channels blocked and that's exactly why I moved over to the 13 millimeter piping to feed each one of these channels. Now, obviously I had to reduce uh, the flow rate on the 13 millimeter piping and I did that by adding in 13 millimeter taps and then I just dial the tap back to the flow rate that I want and I've never ever had a blockage on one of these. So I highly recommend this style of N for your NFT because those four millimeter pipes immediately blocked on me. Again, fool me once, fool me twice, I'm done with them. So behind me, I've got the Dutch buckets. These are the Beto buckets. At the front here, we've got jalapenos and they are producing nicely. Uh, and at the back, we've got a variety of micro tomatoes. As usual, the Dutch buckets are performing fantastically and that's why I love them. And I kept them in this corner of the greenhouse and it's exactly why I wanted to make these. These are the 3D printable snorkels that fit onto the front of our cheap Dutch bucket alternative and they're performing fantastically. I've added in another row of them at the front here. All I did was I drilled out some more holes on the return pipe and fitted some more buckets and I've added in some capsicums which are thriving and there's absolutely no difference between these and the commercially available Dutch buckets in functioning. But I am looking forward to, once the grow is done, comparing the differences in root sizes between the two systems. But that's for a future video. The flood and drain system is going crazy. We've got thyme and oregano as well as basil. It's basically a pizza. At the back, we've got a random fern. I leave it there because I like the look of it. Although it is about to spore and I think I'm going to have a lot more ferns in the greenhouse from now on, but that is okay. I'm letting this cos, which is actually in the NFT, I'm going to let that go to flower and seed. And then I'll cut the stalk and dump it upside down in a bucket, separate the wheat from the chaff in the wind, collect all the seeds, and then I'll have some cos seeds. It's that easy. I will show you here on this side of the NFT, I am having a little bit of a mixed success. Some of the lettuce are just really heading up nicely, like look at that one. Um, and then you've got other ones which have decided to sort of start and bolt, and then they're heading up at the top. In general, I've just been picking these out and eating what I need and throwing the rest of the chickens. I can actually just start planting as the holes appear rather than having whole lots come through. And that is what I'm starting to do because obviously I can't eat a harvest that big on my own. This is the super simple strawberry system and it's about five days in. I'm actually surprised to say all of these strawberry crowns are showing signs of greenery coming out. And that is really good news because I was worried about the heat in these bags and I'll get that thermometer. I dare say they are a little bit warm. It is quite a high temperature in there. So the root temperature is 29 degrees Celsius, uh, which is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. But the difference here is, what I'm hoping to achieve with these strawberries is to get them to the point where they've got enough foliage that they actually cover the black plastic bags. And by that point, I think we'll see that the temperature within the bags drops dramatically. It may actually be a case of pre-planting the bags out with strawberries, propagating them under lights until they're a certain size. And then once we've got some amount of foliage, we can just pick up the bags, which would 
sit happily on a shelf underneath a propagation light, maybe like a shelf lighting system that you could probably put together from hardware components. And then once the canopy's developed, you could just plonk them on a system outside and have perpetual strawberries with the canopy actually protecting the bag from the sun. That would definitely reduce the root temperature. But I think we'll actually get these through to that point anyway. It might just take a bit longer and I'm interested to see how they perform. Let's go and have a look at the identical ones outside on our table. And here they are. They are actually showing signs of greening out as well. I'm really happy with the new end caps. They're performing fantastic. I threw them on with some silicon and I haven't had a problem since. They turned out really well and I'm seeing the same good results from the crowns out here that I was inside. If we turn around, we've got the rain gutter grow systems. These are the old style rain gutter grow systems that I had. I actually had them turned off for ages and I've turned them back on because all of this turmeric ginger, um, even these strawberries started flourishing when in some rain that I had and I was like, okay, well, I guess if they want to live, they want to live. So I turned the systems back on. The hydroponic nutrient has started making its way back up into the cocoa, which was obviously holding a heap of nutrient already because of its CEC or cation exchange capacity. And the rain made that available to the plants the plants thrive, especially because of the rhizomes, obviously the rhizomes holding a ton of energy and just push through. And now that I've started feeding them hydroponic nutrient, they've just exploded. So I'm happy to have this system back up and running. And I planted it out with some zucchinis as well that I had extra just because I figured why not. Speaking of ginger and turmeric, I'm really quite excited to release this video. Um, it's been over a year or it will have been over a year by the time I release it, because I accidentally planted these guys at the beginning of winter. They died back and shot through. In the last video I made about the citrus and all of the self-watering pots, you can see how much growth has happened since then, and that's only been about four weeks. So this is a version of the Wick Wedge hydroponic system that I've used underneath these grow bags, and it is producing a really fantastic result when it comes to growing a ton of ginger and turmeric. So I'm really excited to show you that time lapse and this system. These are the DIY self-watering pots, the larger version, the more intensive to make never water again system that I featured in a video a few weeks ago. They are doing fantastically. Uh, you can see, I'll show you the difference between this shot here and the identical shot about four or five weeks ago when I released that video. And you can tell the plants are doing fantastically. They've grown a heap and I've got really nice canopies on all of the transplanted plants. I'm extremely happy with both the float valves as well as the smart valves from Autopot. I have to say, I think that the smart valves are doing better. However, the plants in the smart valves have an unfair advantage because they were already receiving hydroponic nutrient and they are more established plants as well. So it's not really a fair comparison between the two, but I would hazard a guess to say that the flood and drain cycle on the smart valves is beneficial to those plants. Over to your right, you'll actually see another bagged rock wedge hydroponic system. This one has the cucumbers that I said that I was going to max out the system with at the start of that video. I did it the same day. I just didn't want to cram too much into the video. And I really did some damage to these cucumbers in the process of removing them from the propagation area that they were in. I also managed to make the mistake of putting them up against the chicken enclosure. <laughs> no. Oh, this is wishful thinking, isn't it? which I have amended now with this geofab just to stop them pecking through the fencing and at the new shoots on the cucumbers. So once they get to a large enough size, I will be able to remove that. And what I'm actually hoping does happen is it does provide them with some amount of food. So I want the cucumbers to grow up, fruit down, and also if they grow back down, 
to the level that the chickens can peck at, they can have a munch on their leaves as well. Because once they're up this high and they're getting all of the light from up high, I don't really mind if the bottom leaves are cropped off. But they're doing really well. I think we're really gonna max it out those bags with those cucumbers, but that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I wanna push the system um, to the edge of what's possible. Those cucumbers are going to explore the hell out of that reservoir. And I reckon I'm going to have to regularly remove roots from around that float valve, but we'll see how they go. Back to the area where the fruit trees in our self-watering pots were originally. I've got a trio of plants here that I'm hand watering just because I haven't set them up in a smaller pot that is able to be handled by our self-watering sources. Now I've set up three of these. I actually set up the self-watering sources at my mate's house. I wanted to also have them here so I could test them out myself here. And you can see that I've just placed uh, scoria around the rocks in these sources because of the hydroponic nutrient. I don't want the algae to build up on the surface of the nutrient. I've got a blueberry at the back here, which is producing fruit, but that fruit was already on it when I purchased it. I have an orange in the middle and at the front I have a peach. So I've got a real mix of different species and I'm really looking forward to see how they all respond to the hydroponic situation. All of this is being run on 2.4 EC between 5.5 and 6.5 pH hydroponic nutrient. And it's all being supplied from my 1000 litre IBC hydroponic reservoir, which is gravity feeding literally all of these systems. We'll have a look at the float box hydroponic system next. And here it is. It's doing remarkably well. I have a really bad fungal infection going on on the top of a lot of the cucurbits within the system, mostly zucchinis at the moment, but I have treated that with mancozeb and I will continue treating it until it pesters off. So this system is basically a fabric pot hydroponic system, which is bottom fed. I set up a one meter by four meter pit essentially using wooden surrounds and pond liner, which I then place the fabric pots out into, filled around the outside with river stone. And at the end, I've got a float box. The float box is the same float box that I used for the larger self-watering pots. And that has performed really well in this large system. And it's given me a ton of produce over its lifetime. I think this has been here for about a year, maybe a year and a half. And I haven't changed the cocoa perlite that's in the bags. All I did was I let it rest over winter. Nothing wanted to grow anyway. I replanted it in summer and it's come through with results like this. I'm getting really good fruit off all of the zucchinis and at the front there you can see a pumpkin running away into the foreground. Behind me are the dragon fruits. So these are literally just a mixture of scoria and cocoa. In the base I've got river rock. I did plan on having these connected up to rain gutter grow systems and they have actually got internal wicks if I do want to do that but I've found no need to do that whatsoever, even sporadically watering them from above and then allowing the natural rain events to also moisten the media has been absolutely fine. I've never ever found that I've come out and gone, oh, I really need to water these guys. They just keep powering on. They go a slight lighter green, not at the moment because I've been watering them regularly, um, probably every four or five days, I'll come out and give them a water with the watering can. But when they start to go a paler green, I go, okay, well, I probably need to water them. And then I just come along and they get a third of a watering can each. That's it. I just dump my watering can into my nutrient reservoir from above and water away. That's how simple it can be. Now, if I were to build this system again, I would use wooden poles. That's not because of any nutritional reason. It's just because these plants hold themselves up with their roots. So it would actually allow me to remove all of my ties and not worry about the plant falling away from the pipe. Now, the roots are making their way around the pipe, but there's just no porosity in the PVC for them to grab onto. I would prefer to have them gripping onto a piece of wood. And that's just my own fault. I used what I had around rather than going for the traditional way of doing it. And I thought, everything else I do is made of PVC. Why don't I make this of PVC too? It was wrong. That's fine. 
we live and learn. You don't have to make my mistake. Though they have turned out fantastically and it's not a huge mistake, it's just something that niggles me from time to time. <laughs> All right, so a couple of things that I picked up from the hardware store today. Uh, these three sheets of Rio Mesh and this cement mixer. Now, what do you think I'm gonna use it for? It's gonna be in a video very soon. I'll give you a hint though, I'm not laying a slab. And another question for you. If you were to build a pineapple hydroponic system, how would you build it? Would you go flood and drain, rain gutter grow system, media based, water culture based? Let me know. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts because I'm racking my brain trying to figure out the best way of propagating these guys. And at the moment, I'm almost set on the dragon fruit method, the water from above, succulent bromeliad, maybe even an irrigation timed method. All right, something I never do. Like and subscribe, hit the bell. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, share it with friends. It helps the channel. Happy hydroponicking. And I'll see you next time on Who Chose.